the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
I'm Javed Kaleem. I'm a national and international correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. I'm here in Lisbon, Portugal, which is a city and a country undergoing tremendous change. The foreign population of Lisbon and Portugal is shooting up while the native population has slightly gone down in the last decade. One of these groups that has really started to come in heavy numbers to Portugal is Americans, especially Americans from California. So I'm in town to meet these Americans from LA, from Orange County, from the Valley, and learn why they've decided to relocate here. I moved here from Sebastopol, California, which is in Sonoma County. We were looking for a better life for our son. We wanted to kind of set him, him up in a different way where he wouldn't have any school debt, where he would have access to free health care. And we wanted a place that was similar in temperature and weather to California because we love the weather there. We always knew that Portugal was a really great location in so many different ways. There was a lot of expats moving here and it was actually the easiest place to get a second passport and citizenships. You can eat a really amazing meal here for 10 or 15 euros. So like roughly, let's say 15 US dollars. I save so much money living here, it feels criminal. My apartment in LA, which was a really affordable apartment for the size, I paid $2,500 roughly per month. And I spend less than half of that here. And I have more space. For the average Portuguese person here, you'll make maybe 700 or 1,000 euro a month. Meanwhile, uh, that's the cost of rent for a studio or one bedroom these days. In the last 10 years, a lot of things change in the city. We are talking about gentrification, real estate speculation, um, residential segregation. The value of the houses just doubled. The value of the rents multiplied by six or seven times. It does feel a little bit like California in the way that there's not enough homes for, for the demand. There, there can be some tensions for sure with, for example, Airbnb and its impact on how accessible, affordable places are for locals. But I would say day-to-day -day experience, I feel so welcome. People are starting to catch on that this is a great place to live. I found a community and curated a community before I even arrived here by joining a bunch of the expat groups on Facebook. I created a group called Californians Moving To and Living In Portugal as a support resource for Californians who want to move to Portugal. So I thought people could benefit from the wisdom of Californians already here. When I first started the group, it was sort of slow to grow. It was just a couple people trickling in. But as this wave of Californians started coming in, it is just like every day I'm getting 20 to 50 requests of people who want to move or who want to join the group. One thing I noticed about Portugal and Lisbon is that there was actually a pretty diverse set of people from California and across the U.S. coming into the country. I met retirees who were retiring in their mid-50s because they could afford to in Lisbon, um, but couldn't afford to back home in L.A. I met uh, people in their 30s and 40s who are well into their careers and decided during the COVID year to do remote work from Portugal and keep on doing it um, permanently. And everyone cited cost as a big reason to go to Portugal. But it's getting so popular, so really your savings are now becoming more in the fact that you get more space. Good evening and welcome to Ask a Reporter, the live meetup series where LA Times journalists discuss the news and answer your questions about current events and stories we cover. I'm Javed Kaleem. I'm a foreign correspondent at the LA Times based in London. This year, I launched Global California. Global California is a multimedia series we're doing that explores the connections of California and the West Coast beyond the US borders. In Global California, I've traveled to Portugal and London, of course, and elsewhere uh, upcoming to talk about the complex relationship between the West Coast and the rest of the world. I've written about California expats going to Lisbon and nearby suburbs. You just saw a video with a few of them. Uh, and also about how California is becoming a growing food pipeline with uh, restaurants and, and cuisine to Paris, London, 
Milan, uh, and beyond all over Europe. Our Global California stories have been among the most read stories on our websites in recent weeks. And it, that makes sense because it's a time when people are traveling a lot more. The uh, COVID restrictions uh, are lesser now with airlines. And it's, um, it's a crazy summer season of, of going places, as, as you've seen at the airports. Tonight, I'll talk about my work uh, and, and how I got to do it. And I'll answer your questions as well about what we do at LA Times and what I do in Global California. Please share your questions in the comments on whatever platform you're watching on. So I thought to start, I'd tell you a little bit about myself and, and, and how I came here to be living in London for the LA Times. Um, I began at LA Times about a uh, little more than six years ago in 2016. I joined our national news desk that summer as a national correspondent based in Los Angeles. It was the last summer of the Obama administration. Um, I covered race and justice. So it was when Black Lives Matter protests were growing around the country. Um, a lot of uh, talk and discussion and, and debate about racial justice. And that was my main area that I focused on. Uh, at the time, it was the height of that movement in the country. Um, this was before 2020 when George Floyd was killed and, and the movement grew even bigger. Since then, I've done a variety of beats, as we call them, um, topics that I write about and report on in different ways. I've written about US politics, elections, religion, the environment, including the drought that California is experiencing right now, uh, and covered news out of the Trump administration and the Biden administration. One of my favorite stories that I've done was in 2018, and it relates to how I'm doing Global California now. That story was about uh, Sikh truckers, Sikh, the Punjabi South Asian faith. I joined on a road trip from California to Oklahoma with a trucker to tell the story about the connections and the reach across the nation of this powerful community in Southern California that few people outside that community itself knew about. And right now, I'm going to bring in our assistant managing editor for audience, Samantha Melbourne Weaver. Sam's going to be joining me throughout the conversation and at the end to talk about questions that our audience is asking. And she has one right now. Hi, Javed. Thanks for having me. I will also say that story is one of my all time favorites. And now I see sick truckers on the highways all the time. So, you know, the more you know. Um, our first question tonight is from Eliza Tan, who asks, how does your cultural background influence your work and your storytelling habits? Thanks, Eliza, for your question. Thanks, Sam, uh, for your compliment, too. I'm glad to hear that. Um, try the food next time. Uh, it's really good. Um, oh, well. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, it, my, my background really does influence um, what I report on in some ways. Um, and so I'll tell you, first of all, what my background is. Um, I grew up in Northern Virginia outside Washington, DC, um, and my family is from Pakistan, and, and we're a Muslim family, and we are actually a, um, our ethnic group is Punjabi, which is an ethnic group that is um, divided between India and Pakistan and then other countries where people have immigrated to. Uh, so it's the same group as Sikh truckers. Uh, so we speak the same language and, and have some of the same traditions, if not same religion. Um, so that particular story, um, the reason we were able to do it and, and really get, gain access to a, uh, a community that's um, hard to access sometimes is because uh, I was working with myself and I had some, some background in that community, but also we had a photographer, Irfan Khan, uh, who had written about truckers and, and documented photos about them before and also spoke the language and knew the background. He's from Pakistan, actually. Uh, so with those two together, we had um, a lot easier time finding people to talk to us and, and being able to basically camp out with a trucker for five days straight uh, and you know bug him with videos and photos and questions and, and all of that. But um, my, my cultural background basically, what it's taught me is that, you know, um, one, there's things about that I know kind of 
instinctively or intuitively from how I grew up uh, that are unique perhaps that people who read LA Times or read any publication may not know about a broader audience. And so I can tell some of those stories. And it's also taught me, um, my background has taught me that even when you're part of a certain group, um, uh, a community in some way or a religion or, or culture, uh, you don't know everything about it. Um, you know, there's people different from you in subgroups and subcommunities and subcultures. So, you know, I knew, I, knew, I knew about six. I knew about uh, Punjabis. I knew there were many in California um, or a diverse state. But until I wrote about sick truckers, I didn't know uh, that that was even, you know, an actual trend, so to speak. Um, and so it was brand new to me too. I think those are some of the best stories that, that we get to do as journalists, where we, we learn ourselves about something and teach ourselves. And we also get to tell a fun, interesting story and impeach people who are reading it or viewing it um, in whichever format they do. So I'm gonna move along um, and tell you about how, how this relates to what I'm doing now. So stories like the story on sick truckers that I wrote um, got me thinking over the years about California's influence beyond California itself. Um, you know, where the, the truckers were going to Oklahoma, to Indiana, to grocery stores, to food depots. And I thought, okay, you know, there's more to this. There's more stories like this going on. Um, we're a huge state with a huge population and huge industries. And, and where do they go? They're not just contained to California. So that's what Global California is all about. Since the spring, I've been based in London. I spent my time in two main ways. Part of it is I'm about two hours behind the time zone in Ukraine. So I have been assisting our reporters who are on the ground there covering news in Ukraine. Um, they're doing logistics, they're, they're trying to stay safe, they're trying to uh, at times you know, dodge actual bullets uh, or you know, bombs and things like that. So I, I help them craft their articles and take the snippets they get, the, the photos they get, and put something together for a website early in the morning while people in LA are sleeping. The other part of my job here has been focused on exploring California connections through articles, videos, social media, um, and being in touch with readers and viewers like yourselves. We have a population of about 40 million in California. Um, we're a huge state where we're, you know, a big deal in many ways. Uh, think of any sort of movement or industry in California, you know, Hollywood, music, tourism, environmentalism, Silicon Valley, car culture, we're feeling it right now, language and diversity, big historic immigrant communities and smaller, newer ones, liberal politics, but also very conservative politics. You'll find both. Um, very powerful in different parts of California. So in global California, what we're doing is, is taking these big movements and parts of what California culture and history and what California right now is, and showing how the story of California is really in many ways, the story of the nation and the world. And I'll bring Sam back in right now as this little postcard. Uh, for another question uh, that actually I think relates to, to that subject of where where we are as Californians versus the world, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will also say, just if you're watching this, wherever you're watching, leave a question, um, and we'll we'll ask it right here on the show. Um, this question comes from Andrew Grainer, uh, who asks, "How is California, and how are Californians perceived in Europe and elsewhere in the world? Are we seen as a state of vapid surfer valley guys and girls?" Or are we like totally taken seriously? <laughs> I like how you you yeah you said that totally taken seriously. I'm a valley um, girl. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I I'll, I'll say I I uh, have never you know living in the U.S. I don't really have a super distinct accent for the U.S. But um. Uh, in the UK and London, I've really enjoyed people thinking my accent is cute. So that's fun. Um, but uh, 
California actually is perceived as like a really um, attractive place uh, all, all around Europe. I kind of like to compare it, you know, um, it kind of goes both ways. You know, some people in, in the U.S. sort of romanticize Europe, um, be it because of its, its charming small towns, the medieval history, um, the the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, all these things, um, the 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 Queen of England, you know, the list goes on. Um, and and I, I partake in some of that too. Um, it's just so different in many ways than, than the, the US or LA even. Um, but it goes the other way too. People in London and in Paris and beyond really think California is kind of like an exotic place. Like they see it in the movies and on TV. They see the palm trees. They they know the street names. They, they, can, they can kind of draw you a map of LA without ever having been there sometimes. And a lot of it is because of just the culture that California exports around the world. Um, I was somewhere today. Um, I, I was at a, a pub today and people, I don't know what they were talking about, but I just overheard them talking about Laguna Beach. Um, not the TV show from a while ago, but the actual beach. And I don't know what, what they were going for, but it, it just kind of, things like that happen all the time where you hear about California over and over again. Um, so I think it's taken very seriously to answer the question. Um, I think it's, people are, they want to come and visit and see what it is. And that actually kind of takes me to, to our next topic, um, that exchange or that, that kind of mutual interest between California and, and Europe or the rest of the world at large. Our first story, as you saw in the video, was about Portugal and the growing group of Californians who are moving to Portugal. So I'll tell you, I've got this idea. Um, I actually know some people who, who want to move to Portugal. A couple of years ago, my brother-in-law and my sister told me they were thinking of going to Lisbon and living there. Uh, now their plan, plans changed because they had a baby uh, and they wanted to stay in the US and then the pandemic happened and that changed things also. But, uh, they got me thinking over the years and, you know, kind of in the back of my mind, I thought, huh, is this a thing people do? Um, and when I was thinking about ways to approach this Global California series, I thought back to that and I thought, okay, are there other people going to Portugal who want to go there? And I found a lot. I found out my editor's brother uh, lives there part-time. I found a Facebook groups of Californians, like you saw in the video at the beginning. Uh, I found groups of Californian uh, parents with kids going to California on Facebook. I found tons of TikTok videos. I found kind of all these resources um, about how to make it to Portugal. Uh, and, and what shocked me was they were specifically targeted toward people from California and how they can make it there. Um, and the reason, the reason is this, because people in California who moved to Portugal, uh, they see a lot of similarities. There's a big wine culture and, and food culture. There's a ton of beaches at this, you know, mostly coastline in the country. They see less gun violence too. They see a more universal healthcare system. Um, they see sunny weather, you know, that kind of glow that you get in LA uh, when the sun's about to set. You see, get that same glow in Portugal and Lisbon. And there are, um, so many resources for Californians going there that I thought I have to go find, find out who they are, meet them and figure out what it's all about. Uh, Sam is gonna come in now with a, another question, I think about Portugal from one of our readers. Look, I swear I'm asking for a friend. That friend's name is Jill Smith. But I will also say that we saw a lot of comments along these lines when this story was published about people going like, wait a second, that sounds great. How do I get in on this? So Jill asks, is it still possible to get a golden passport to Portugal? How long can a tourist stay in Portugal and can a U.S. citizen buy property? And are there restrictions on where they can buy? So I think a lot of people were very inspired by your reporting and kind of very interested in, in what the options are. I'm happy to answer this question, uh, Jill or Sam, whoever asked it, possibly both. <laughs> um, but thank you, Jill. Uh, so, um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about it because this is actually something that people ask a lot about um, in various comments to me in emails, uh, on Twitter, 
uh, on Instagram, even just getting messages kind of, I've become sort of an advice giver about Portugal, it seems. Um, there's different ways to relocate to Portugal uh, and the country, you know, over the last decade plus has basically asked foreigners, uh, asked people from wealthier countries um, who have remote jobs or who are retired to come and live there. Uh, they've advertised it. So one way is to basically um, get a visa where you agree to earn money abroad and spend it in Portugal. Uh, and that allows you to, to live there and receive jo a job from your online remote workplace in the US or elsewhere. Another option though, um, which is more expensive, is called the Golden Passport. A lot of countries have this program now, it's been similar to it. Um, in Portugal, what it means is you have to spend about $500,000 um, and purchase or invest in a property in Portugal. And with that investment, you essentially get the right to move to the country and set up residency there. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a, a quick, expensive way uh, to essentially, you know, purchase the right to live in Portugal. Um, so they are still doing those golden visas, but they've become so popular uh, that they've actually just this year restricted them. Uh, so you used to be able to buy a, a home in Lisbon or Porto. Uh, as of this January, you no longer can do that. Uh, those areas are kind of blocked uh, from the Golden Passport program. Uh, but you can go elsewhere in the country, uh, uh, the more kind of inland areas that are, are a little cheaper and um, haven't experienced the same kind of like hyper rapid development that cities have. Uh, but you can just visit also. Um, as, as a U.S. citizen, you can go to Portugal uh, and many European countries for up to about three months at a time uh, without having to get a visa, um, just as a tourist trip. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a place people are just visiting for tourism a ton too. There's so many Airbnbs there. Um, so Jill, I don't know if you're planning on, on moving there, but uh, uh, good luck. I, I made it sound easier than it is. There's a lot of paperwork still, but um, but it, it is possible. So one thing we do in Global California is that we want to reach our audiences in, in different ways. Um, we're not just a newspaper. That's that's one part of what we do at LA Times, and that's um, you know that's one of many parts, really. Uh, my colleague Sam, who's been on the chat here, uh, oversees a, a lot of our audience engagement uh, from Instagram uh, to Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and the list goes on as well as live events and things like that. But we're also doing the Global California podcast. We're doing newsletters. Uh, we have one actually just for Global California. You can sign up for it to read my future stories. Um, you can go to latimes.com slash global California, or when you go to an article that I, I've written, at the bottom, you can actually click a link to sign up for Global California Story Alerts. I wanna tell you about a different kind of story I did more recently in Global California. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you first about how I got to it. So one thing I find really fun and interesting is to ask, reporters, ask journalists, you know, how they, how they figure out what to write about or what, what, how ideas strike them, what makes them write about these unique and interesting places or, or people. Um, so for Portugal is my sibling. That was really, uh, you know, the onus of it. And, and I told her actually recently, and she was very excited by that. Um, but in some cases, stories just, you know, you walk into them, they kind of just hit you in front of your face. And, and that happens quite often with a lot of journalists um, because we're, our jobs to, are to be explorers and kind of just absorb as much as we can. Uh, so I was walking around Soho recently. Um, this is Soho in London. Uh, and it's a, you know, really popular neighborhood of restaurants and, and small streets and nightlife and bars and all kinds of things, very popular with tourists near the center city. And I was walking around just exploring and I saw a small brightly lit restaurant with white tablecloths and um, 
air plants hanging from the ceiling. And on the outside, it had a, a kind of sun illustration on its signpost, and it called itself Sola, like S-O-L-A, Sola. And it advertised itself as having an entire menu of California foods and wines at the price of more than $170 per meal. That's a set course tasting menu. So I didn't go to eat there, uh, but I, did go, I went home with a question. I went and looked it up. I, I began reading about the chef and, and trying to figure out you know, what this place was, trying to find the menu. And, and my question was, what is a California restaurant doing in London? And at that price, are people going to it? What is a California, what does California cuisine even mean? Um, especially in a place like London where it's rainy and gray a lot of the time and just looks so different than, than LA or San Francisco even. What I found was that the idea of California cuisine and food is in many ways becoming more and more popular in Europe. I found Sola London. And from there, I found spots all across the continent that were doing, in one way or another, something pretty similar. I'm going to bring Sam in, who has another question on, on California cuisine. Hey, yeah, we just right along the lines of what you're talking about. Um, we have a question from Yesenia Padilla, uh, who asked, how do you see the growth of the wine industry in California? Um, is it reaching outside of the U.S., uh, specifically in like old world countries and old world markets? Well, so um, to begin with where I am in London, it's, there's not, there is a wine industry here, but it's not, you know, world renowned in the same way that say France is or Italy is uh, for its wine. Um, of course, California and Italy are often compared uh, for their topography and their climate and, and their wine, right? Santa Barbara is kind of described as like a, the, um, you know, the American Riviera, so to speak. That's the word they use for it. But uh, what I have noticed, though, actually, is there's a huge desire for California wine. Um, you can go to any restaurant here and, you know, they'll have a, a big list of European wines or, or French or Italian mostly. Um, but they'll always have stuff in California. Same in wine shops. Um, I was uh, at a restaurant in London recently um, that does pop-ups. They do just, you know, short three or four week uh, or even shorter restaurant visits and visiting chefs from around the world. So they had recently a Ukrainian chef uh, who was doing Ukrainian food. They had um, a chef from Paris. They had a chef from Nashville, um, another from Brooklyn. And one of the most recent events was they had a winery from Napa come and visit and set up a, a wine a wine restaurant, a wine bar, just for two weeks in London. Um, so they, they traveled from California to London. That's, that's a you know 10-hour trip. And they brought their wine with them. So it's happening uh, in many ways. Um, I, you know, in these restaurants that I wrote about, um, Montecito was one in Paris. Uh, it's a, at a hotel uh, near the center of the city. Uh, they have an entire list of California wines, many from Santa Barbara. Sola London is another spot. Uh, their, their wines were, it certainly struck me, they didn't have just Napa and Sonoma wines that you're used to. They had wines from Santa Inez and Los Olivos, uh, you know, northeast of Santa Barbara, um, Los Alamos, you know, these places that if you live in LA and you like wine or you've um, seen the movie Sideways, maybe you, you know about the, this, these areas, but if you're from halfway across the world, you might not recognize them per se. So I actually think people don't really look down on California wine here at all. Um, it's, it's, a, it's something different and cool to them. Um, and more unique, you know, people co covet kind of things that are harder to get. Um, and, and things that are California, really, because California is known as the state of food and drink. There's so much agriculture in California, wine among, the, among one of them. Um, if you've ever gone to a restaurant that calls itself farm to table, if it changes the menu daily with a new print or new items, or if you look at a menu and it says which farm your gem lettuce is from, uh, you've probably brushed up against California cuisine. Um, 
the term from the 70s and 80s is its origin. It's all about fresh ingredients, simple prep, a little butter and cream, and close relationships with farmers and farmers markets. So the history of it is there's a couple kind of founding restaurants, um, two, a couple that are still operating today. So one is Chez Panisse in Berkeley. The chef is Alice Waters. Um, she's, you know, even if you don't really, aren't really a food person, you probably have heard her name somewhere. Um, she also currently has a restaurant set up at a museum in, the, in LA. Uh, another is Michael's in Santa Monica. Uh, and there's also Spago, which was in Beverly Hills. I'm sorry, which was in West Hollywood when it opened and is now in Beverly Hills by Wolfgang Puck. So these restaurants are kind of considered um, among the originals or kind of the founders of California cuisine. And, you know, you go to them today and they kind of seem, you might think they're nothing special. They're good food and, and delicious, but, you know, they're one of many. But when they first arrived on the scene, they were sort of pioneering. Um, and helped shape all kinds of restaurants around the country. And I discovered, I discovered now the world. Uh, so I saw California restaurants in London, Paris, Milan, Frankfurt, um, Milan, Italy, you know, where the, I mean, there's an entire food culture there, right? Of uh, not just pasta, but seafood and more. And, and they're doing California cuisine. I was kind of shocked at that. Now you'll find a lot of avocado toast on these menus too. Um, so it's you know high cuisine to low cuisine. And then you'll also find a huge adoration in London, but Europe especially at large for um, California burgers. People think that you know of all American places we do the best burgers and they always point to in and out So there was an in and out um, pop-up in London a couple of years ago. People waited for five hours in line. Um, they actually ran out of burgers and they brought their burgers, their meat, everything uh, on airplanes from California to London uh, just for like a day. So um, it, it's, a, it's a big deal here. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of cool, right? It makes me kind of proud. Um, not that I have anything to do with in and out per se, but like, it's cool to say, oh, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm from this state, I live in this state and, and it's, it's fun to see people excited about California, so far away from California. Um, you know, I'd like to tell you a bit about um, uh, about what I do now uh, as a journalist, um, because I get a lot of questions about what my job is like, you know, not just how I get my stories, but um, who assigns my stories? Are, are they my own ideas or, or, or even what my days are like? Am I on the phone all day? Am I on the road all day? Um, am I tweeting all day? You know, what, what combination of things am I doing uh, to, to do my job as a journalist? Um, and I'll say it's a kind of a combination of all those things, actually. Uh, in the US, I, I spent the last couple of years really covering a lot of really hard, serious, you know, heavy breaking news. Um, what happened on January 6th, that was covering that uh, last year. I covered the COVID pandemic from the beginning uh, through its continuation today. Um, the presidential elections, um, riots and, 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 and uh, police violence and racial justice protest. Uh, and so here I'm doing some of the same things. Uh, I've been covering, helping cover war in Ukraine. Uh, and then I've done, you know, some of the more lighter, funner, but but still important news that I've just discussed about food and culture and and migration and travel. Um, my days usually begin, uh, you know, I work on LA time. I'm sorry, I work on London time. Uh, so it's actually two thirty in the morning here. Uh, I took a nap so I could be kind of awake for you all. <laughs> um, but uh, that's actually that kind of happens a lot, you know. Uh, when it, 5 p.m. comes around in London, it's 9 a.m. in Los Angeles. So I have quiet days where mostly I'm working solo or doing interviews or arranging things. Or we're also working with our London-based news editor, Henry Chu. Um, and then there's a bit of a lull sometimes. And at night, things get busier because all my colleagues, my editors, um, people I want to collaborate with, uh, like Sam and others, uh, 
log on at that time and, and we have to work together. So uh, the job, job of a reporter isn't always really a nine to five kind of job, uh, but you're not always working continuously all day either, unless the news is really breaking. And then sometimes you are. Um, I want to tell you also regarding news, uh, you know, how I've covered some, some of my news stories recently. Um, we've been really, really invested in the coverage of the war in Ukraine uh, since before the invasion was launched on February 24th. And I spent uh, about, you know, on and off two months um, helping my colleagues on the ground there, Nabi Bulos, Patrick McDonald, Laura King, uh, photographers and others take their reporting, take their feeds, as we call them, basically small paragraphs and, and quotes they get from their reporting and people they interview, and craft news updates that uh, would be continuously updated overnight uh, and be ready for you in the morning to read in LA time. Uh, this is a pretty common practice among journalists when this big breaking news story of war zone. And Someone like me, basically, I I've, uh, haven't been there myself, but I, I read all the news online. I, I do interviews via phone and email, and I I try to keep LA Times readers up to date, you know, to the moment with what's happening. Um, since our jobs are to keep you informed and and and, and tell you things accurately, uh, I've also had some fun covering some London news. Um, you know, there was a big party here for the Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth. She uh, had her birthday and she's been on the throne for 70 years, which is record breaking. Um, so that was interesting and kind of fun. Uh, and then there is also a no confidence vote for the prime minister in uh, the UK, Boris Johnson, um, who uh, has been unpopular because he broke the COVID rules here and ha had some parties with wine and cheese in his garden uh, at his residence. Um, while the rest of the country was, you know, not allowed to basically go to restaurants or go too far outside. Uh, so it's been a mix of things. Um, but I, I, you know, quite enjoyed what I'm doing and it's been really fun to collaborate. Uh, I also should mention, we have a fantastic uh, audience engagement editor, Rachel Schnauzer, who is also working in the background right now, uh, looking at our audience questions. And, and we've both teamed up uh, to make sure our our global California stories uh, reach the, you know, go far and wide and, and really um, come to readers like you in, in various ways. Uh, so it's been an exciting experience. And, uh, and I'll go to my last topic before your questions now. Um, I want to give you a sneak peek of, of what's coming up with Global California. So we've done food, uh, we've done travel and immigration to Portugal. Uh, my colleague, David Pearson, also had a Global California story about the growth of California cuisine in Singapore that recently ran. And in our next piece next month, we're gonna tell the story of Hollywood's growing influence in unexpected places. Um, in, un in corners of Europe, you wouldn't expect such as the Baltics or Southern European islands. Um, and we're also looking at the global connections between LA and the gaming world, uh, like places in Warsaw and Rotterdam that are looking to and coming to LA to make their games and sell their games. Um, so I'm excited to, to take you along for the ride. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask Sam to hop back in now. I think we have some more questions from readers. We do, we do. I think the next one is a, is a great follow-up to some of what you've discussed already. Um, Yusra for Razan asks, where do you look for story ideas? I mean, you said sometimes you stumble into them, but when you're out, uh, you know, looking for something, how do you, how do you find things? Um, I, yeah, so sometimes you stumble into it. Um, a, lo a lot of the job is really just keeping abreast of the news, you know, reading, kind of being a very hungry reader or viewer, absorber of news in various ways and trying to, um, know what's going on in the world and, and uh, kind of know what the conversation is, what the issues are of the day. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've been reading a ton, of course, recently about uh, the January 6th hearings or, or the Supreme Court decision on abortion. Um, and those aren't necessarily things happening here in London or Europe per se, but I, I 
nonetheless, I'm thinking about, well, how do those relate to, to issues here um, uh, regarding, you know, reproductive health or regarding uh, democracy, right? And, and kind of where the um, politics are going in the country or in the world, really. Uh, something else I'd like to do is I, I just like to, you know, it's fun to talk to people and just learn about them. And really, I've, I've been at, you know, dinner parties or, you know, uh, conferences or even religious services. I, I used to be a religion reporter. And I think one of the best things you can do is just go kind of hop into a community like a religious service where they're always welcoming um, and just learn about a group of people in a certain place. And you get story ideas because uh, it's all about telling people about what they don't know um, or what you don't know, like I said earlier, with sick truckers. I have a I have a follow up question just for me, my curiosity. I want to know how do you how do you embed yourself in a new environment? You moved to a brand new country across an ocean. How do you root yourself in that place? And you're especially I mean you're trying to cover an entire continent really, or I guess the world. Um, how do you how do you feel like a, how do you build a sense of community and a sense of understanding without feeling like you're sort of parachuting in? You know, what, one thing, I mean, I'll, I'll say, first of all, I, I like that question a lot. I think it's really important um, for anybody, not just a journalist, but for anybody who goes somewhere new. Um, for one, it takes a long time to, to get to know a place. Um, I've lived in uh, LA. I was living in LA for about six plus years, and I still don't think I know LA the way I could know LA. I know it a lot more than I used to. Um, but there's still places I haven't been, things I don't know about, uh, um, you know. Uh, so it's in London or in Europe, a whole continent, um, there's still so much to learn. I, I only know a sliver of it. Um, one thing that's been really helpful specifically on, on Europe and the UK and, and issues about politics or, or news stories uh, is that we have a fantastic editor based in London, uh, Henry Chu, who he was a correspondent uh, for the LA Times in, in London, in Brazil, in India, in China. Um, and he's lived here for quite some time uh, with the LA Times and previously with Variety. So he's uh, really well versed in, in the history and, and the politics of the UK and Europe. Um, so that's been useful to me. But uh, honestly, I mean, when you're in a new place, you just walk around, you just want to go places, everything that you might find boring. Uh, back home, suddenly interesting, just because it's in a you know new environment. Um, so that's kind of it's it's fun to see a place with fresh eyes, so to speak. That's really great. Thank you. Um, back to audience question. Um, this one comes from Stacy Beard, who asks, "What is the most significant cultural shift you've noticed over your career that has changed or impacted your work?" Also, keep up the good work. Thank you, Stacy. I love the encouragement. Um, it's really awesome to hear from, from readers who like what we're doing. I like that. Uh, there's been so many cultural shifts. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, for journalism, it's not, it is a cultural shift. It's techno technological one too. And it's, it's one people always talk about, but I think it's nonetheless important to emphasize is it, it is the, um, the internet, right? Technology and, and ways people receive their news, uh, receive their information. Um, uh, the internet's been around the entire time I've been a journalist, but but it's a uh, now it's the, uh, now is the primary way uh, people receive information and news. Um, you know, my upcoming story I'm writing about. I've been talking to companies like Netflix and uh, HBO uh, about TV shows and, and documentaries they're doing and. Um, and, and uh, you know, the documentary and just learning about how much people learn about world events through, through streaming uh, programs. Um, you know, I'm like a lot of people, I'm, I'm, I'm always glued to Twitter and I, 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 my TikTok algorithm shows me the most ridiculous things all the time and, and same with Instagram. I don't post a lot of any of those, but I um, think those have really influenced the way I see the news uh, for better sometimes and for worse sometimes. Uh, so you have to kind of combine your online presence and interest also with kind of um, 
what journalists call shoe leather reporting or your in-person experience and, and, and find a good balance of both. Sounds great. Um, next question, it's my, probably my favorite of the night. I, I just really love it. This is from Barbara Howard, who wants to know about fashion. Um, she asked, do, do trends of youthful fashion and energy flow equally between LA and the United Kingdom or more predominantly LA to the UK or the other way, UK to the LA? Huh. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I'm not the best person per se, cause I don't think I'm very fashionable, but <laughs> disagree. disagree. But, You're very but, fashionable. But I think the coolest thing about me maybe is that my hair is long, but beyond that, uh, there's not much going on here, <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, I, well, so I, I've lived in New York, uh, before LA, LA, I was a reporter at Huffington Post and I lived in New York city. Uh, prior to that, I lived in Miami working as a reporter there at the Miami Herald and, uh, LA obviously had lived there. So I, I, I say that cause I lived in three very, um, you know, fashiony, cool, popular cities for various different reasons. Um, and uh, being in London, having been to a few other places, I was in Paris uh, two months ago or so. Um, yeah, the, the fashion is the same, really. I mean, you know, if you're talking about like street fashion, um, uh, obviously I wasn't into in any like big fashion shows or anything looking at that stuff, but uh, the, the street styles, uh, especially among young people, are, are super similar to what you see in LA. I'm not sure if you can say where it begins and where it ends or where it comes from. Um, uh, it, I mean, I think a, a lot of it's probably, you know, kind of happens at the same time in different places because people of how they get inspired by style, people they follow or musicians or, or fashion companies or, or brands um, or, you know, Instagram or other accounts that are into fashion. So I, I, I'm not sure if it's one place can take credit over the other. Um, I think they're, they're both uh, pretty big in that world. I think you're being, you're playing coy. I think you're setting the trends, probably in both places. And, I mean, that's the connection. If, uh, well, if, if people don't know Sam too well, Sam makes her own clothing and they're super cool. So so I, I think you've set the trend, but <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> maybe neither of us, maybe. <laughs> um, our next question comes from Stuart Gilman, um, who asks about a different kind of trend. Um, what's the trend in how people in other countries view California as a place to seek education or to work, uh, especially given the global changes in U.S. politics and economies? That's a really interesting question. Um, People, I think, despite the changes in the U.S., uh, you know, look at the economy, uh, look at gas prices right now, things like that, or, but that's a global phenomenon, really, um, or look at uh, people who just really dislike the Trump era or even the Biden era or just the general polarization of the country. Um, people still look towards California and still look to the U.S. as places they want to be, um, whether they want to visit or immigrate or go work in LA, uh, you know, whenever I'm in another country, uh, whether I'm working or just as a tourist, I always end up getting a question about how somebody can make their way over to LA or, or to the US. Um, uh, so, you know, I think there's something about people where they, all, they tend to think um, the grass is always greener on the other side, so to speak. Uh, so this happens too with, you know, the UK, there's a lot of um, expat groups I've joined online to just see the conversations in different countries about Americans and Californians and where they're moving. And I was doing that as part of my reporting on Portugal. And I'm in one for uh, Americans uh, who want to move to the UK. Um, and uh, it's interesting to see the conversations um, because a lot of people want to come here from the US because they they think it's um, politically, they don't like the way the US is going and they think it, they, these are liberal people and they think the UK is better off. Um, and then the people who are from the UK, they, they often respond to these chat groups and say, no, we're just, we're having the same, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, on a conservative track just like you guys are. Um, so I'm not sure what you're looking for. So it's interesting. People are always, I think, it's kind of in human nature to 
look for something better. Um, but California is still super attractive. I mean, I, I want to go back. So <laughs> I miss it. That's nice. California misses you too, Javid. Um, this is our second to last question. Um, really great questions tonight. Uh, this is my second favorite. favorite. <laughs> Michael Becerra asks, what's the global reputation of the Dodgers? Is there one? Did you plant this question, Samantha? Is this, is this you again? I am both Jill and <laughs> Michael. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, I will, okay, first I'll admit I'm not a big Dodgers person. I'm not against them. Um, and I, I obviously know the main, uh, you know, arcs of the Dodgers uh, from being a journalist. I need to know these things in LA uh, or else Sam will get me. Uh, but, uh, and I've been to a few games. Uh, but I have not seen anything about the Dodgers here. Um, nothing. Uh, but you know, you'll see going to like a, a pub or even like in a park, you'll see people playing cricket in the parks. Um, in the pubs, you'll see rugby games being played, obviously soccer or football, of course, as they call it is huge. Um, and then one thing I've noticed a lot of is, uh, or a few times at least, I've I've seen walking around bars that advertise the NFL um, with you know big NFL logos and saying they play the games there and and, and so on and so forth. And I, uh, I that struck me as really interesting, and I, I was you know, curious how how many people actually go watch. Um, so the NFL has had games in London uh, since two thousand seven. Um, uh, and I think nearly every team has actually played here at some point since then. Uh, but I'm curious how much traction that's actually getting. So no Dodgers, um, but if you like football, the soccer kind or the football kind, as we call it, you can see it here. So much football to choose from. <laughs> um, all right. And this is our last question. This comes from Donna, who helped us put on our event, our book club editor, Donna Wears. Um, she says, right on brand for Donna, you led a bookstore book club here in LA. What are your favorite bookstores in London? I did. Okay. So I, I don't know how Donna knew about this. Um, yeah, I, I, I ran a book book club at the last, uh, bookstore. Um, and it was called the state of the union. So I talked about, uh, once a month kind of took a book and uh, talked about current events, basically. Um, so one was on immigration and, and the DACA program. Uh, another one was on, on um, LGBTQ rights and there, there were other subjects that I covered. Uh, and that went away um, during the pandemic when things closed down. Uh, in London, I am sorry to say I have not been to many bookstores. Uh, I've, I've been to little, little ones here and there that are... Um, kind of, you know, thrift stores. Um, they call them charity shops here, uh, but it's the same thing. Uh, but um, one I know that is a, a big deal here that I've been meaning to go to, I believe it's called, uh, I'm going to screw up the name, Dot Books. Uh, so that's one I, I believe I should make it to. Um, and I, I want to actually go to some more. Um, maybe I'll do a story on bookstores. I wonder if there are some, some book stores from LA that are making it here or, or, or books or authors that are kind of coming across the Atlantic. That could be interesting. And I, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. If you can find like a Joan Didion bookstore in London, I mean, that would just be perfect. That'd be so cool. Um, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't put it past people to have a John Didion bookstore. I and mean, why, why wouldn't they want to have one, right? Why, yeah, why don't we have more here, you know? Yeah, you'd have to have a lot of copies. Of, I mean, she has a good collection. We still have to have a lot of copies of each. The, yeah, they're pretty short. They're pretty short. <laughs> um, last question. I lied. I have a new question. If people have more questions for you, Javed, how can they get in contact? Where should they, where should they send their questions? Yeah, so um, I know we had some more questions. We couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but I'm happy to always answer questions. Um, I try to respond to any email I get uh, from readers, um, especially students, if you have questions about journalism and you know how to get your start and things like that or advice. So it's my name. It's um, 
you see my name on screen. So it's javed.kaleem at latimes.com. Uh, and then on social media, I, my name is um, on all the platforms the same, just my first name, last name uh, with no spaces or anything. Uh, and so I can always reply there too. All my accounts are public and accessible and I, I look at my inboxes. So you can find me in different ways. And if you're in London, I'm here too. Awesome, thank you. And come back soon, we miss you. Thank you, okay, I'll see you. Thanks, thanks so much everyone for joining tonight. And uh, I'm gonna get some sleep. And I, <laughs> I will, uh, uh, I'll look forward to, to being in the audience for the next conversation. <laughs>